Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So Heavenly Father on this feast, the most holy trinity, we give all glory, and praise and honor to your name. And in great confidence, we resign ourselves to your holy will. We place this hour in your hands so that you form our thoughts, our words, guide our listening, you inspire us so that through our knowledge and through participation, we grow deeper into your divine will. We ask the intercession of Mary and of Saint Joseph. Amen. The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, since it's the Feast of the Trinity, it gives us a good topic to start with as we keep going because we're going to now revise one of the key the key principles of living in the divine will remember there's three great mysteries of our faith three great mysteries the first mystery is that of the trinity so the mystery we celebrate in the liturgy tonight, or today, that is the greatest, that is the focus, the center of everything else without exception. So that God, who before creating the world existed, totally in joy, in love, completely content within his own being. And so it's the overflow of his love that brings about the creation. Therefore, everything else is going to focus on giving back to God or giving to God the glory that is rightfully his. God, in a sense, couldn't even change that should he wish to. In other words, the nature of God being God, uncreated, necessarily means that everything that is created owes its being, its very existence, to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is the most important principle of our faith, and therefore, we will see that this is the purpose of the gift of living in the divine will. The first aim is to give glory and praise to God that is his due. Just as an aside, it's important to remember in prayer, and this is something David Talkington points out, it's something important to remember in prayer, to remember to thank God for simply being God. We often quite rightly give thanksgiving and we're called upon to thank God for creation, for our sanctification, for our redemption. And that is good to give praise and glory to God for the gifts he gives us. But we also need to remember that God is owed thanks just for being God. Now, that's something it takes a bit of getting our head around. It's something we have to think about and contemplate because it seems a little bit strange. But when we reflect upon it, it takes us into a marvelous contemplative gaze on God when we think of just God as God. 
for being God. Just to complete the picture, the second mystery that flows from that is the mystery of the incarnation. So that God to reveal himself, which he did in the Old Testament through creation, through the patriarchs, the prophets, in signs, in symbols. As the book of Hebrews says, now he speaks through his son. So in the eternal son of the father, who took flesh, God has spoken once and for all. So if we think about Jesus as simply the word spoken, the logos in Greek, and therefore that's why revelation is complete, because everything God the Father utters is contained in the Son. Now, just bear in mind, you'll see why this is all relevant as we move along tonight. The third mystery, which we tackled a little bit last week and the week before, the third mystery connects those. So the Trinity, the incarnation, and then when Jesus ascended into heaven to return to the Father and send the Holy Spirit, he entered into the mysteries. The mysteries being the liturgy. We're not, we're not going to spend time on that aspect tonight. So Jesus, by entering into the mysteries, becomes closer to us. He is able to dwell within us. So as he went further away physically, he became so much more intimately part of us. Okay, so those three mysteries. So what we're going to look at now through the Trinity is the whole central theme of living the divine will. To understand it, we have to understand a bit of the nature of God. So there's a bit of theology involved here. And also how Christ serves as a link to that. And that, I think, is the better place to start. So I'm going to start at the end of Matthew's Gospel. This is the very last paragraph, Matthew 28. It's a passage that's probably well known to you after the Easter season. You remember Jesus on a number of occasions passed the message back to his disciples that they were to meet him in Galilee. And this has a beautiful, we're not going to repeat what we've taught before, this has a beautiful intimacy about it, as if there's a special place that they know, a special place of meeting with the Lord. And we each have, in that sense, our Galilees, special meeting places with the Lord. So they set out to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. And when they saw him, they fell down before him, though some hesitated. Jesus came up and spoke to them. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all the commands I gave you. And look, I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. So we see in this passage the all-encompassing authority of Jesus. It's contained in all those repetitions of all, all power, all might, all authority is given to me. 
Go teach all nations. So in this last speech of Jesus, in this Gospel of Matthew, we see, as it were, everything coming to its conclusion. All authority is given to Christ. And now he is passing on that authority to his disciples. Okay. So just bear with me in that light. We should bear in mind and think a bit about what is Jesus commanding them to do? There's a series of imperatives. Go, teach, baptize. They are sent forth. But he didn't bestow this upon his disciples simply to communicate teaching, decrees, an ideology, although those are definitely present, what he is passing on to his disciples to communicate is a being itself, a mystery, a participation in the very life of Christ, which then takes us up into the life of God himself. So we must always remember that to be a Christian is fundamentally, and it's a good thing to have and to think through when people ask you, remember St. Peter says, you know, have a reason when people ask you to give for your faith. If someone asks us, why are we Christian? Our primary answer should be we are Christian because it takes us in to the very mystery and life of God himself. Everything else, what we believe, how we act, both very important, flow from that. So the apostles are there to be other Christ to communicate the presence and action of Christ so that those then can also, like the disciples, be taken up into the life of God. So that's really the first point I'm making today, a very simple one, which is that in this passage of Matthew, we are seeing that Christ has all authority. He's returning to the Father, and he is giving that command now to be passed on by his disciples. Okay? Now, what we then now want to look at is, what is then the nature from where this power and authority of Christ lies. Okay, we're going to look at it in a bit more difficult, a bit more detail, because this will then show us that the essence of Christ, the essence of his being sent by the Father, as in Psalm 40, is to carry out the will of the Father. So a very important verse in this comes from chapter 5 of St. John. And if you remember during Lent, the church in the last few weeks concentrates to a great extent on chapters 5 and 7. Because, why does, it, why does the church do that? Because in this interchange with the scribes and the Pharisees, we see the very nature of who Christ is. And he makes this clear. So the very important verse from that, John chapter 5, verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing by himself. 
unless he sees the father doing it. For whatever the father does, the son also does. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. So there you have encapsulated the whole mission of Jesus from his incarnation to his ascension. And that's a beautiful thing if we imagine a little bit into that. The son looks and sees everything that the father does. And it's that and only that that he carries out on earth. Okay, now I'm going to use a short extract from the fourth volume of a commentary on St. Matthew that I've mentioned before, Erasmo Liva Maricarpis, because he really uh, explains this very well and in a very interesting way. So bear in mind all these seeds we're planting now, authority, the mission of Christ to do whatever he sees the Father doing. So he starts off by quoting that passage I've just um, said, and he says, nevertheless, the continuity of my unique God-created personhood is at the same time assured since each one's individual identity reflects God's image irreplaceably from the beginning. And yet the new vital organizing principle of my life can no longer come from me, but from must derive from another. That is from the will of the one whom together with Jesus, I can address as our father. So Erasmo Liva Maricakis, is, this is a commentary on this passage we've read from St. Matthew. So he's saying in the light of this command, in the light of what Christ is doing and passing on, my, the principle of my life and of the transformation of my life can no longer come from myself. It has to come from the one, Christ, who together with the Father, we address. So this is the whole background now, moving from this command of Jesus to his disciples and his authority. He is telling us that to be transformed, to be transformed is to surrender ourselves to a principle from another. Again, this is something that's difficult for the modern mind because we've had four or five hundred years of bit by bit this whole nature of total dependency on God being played down and becoming much more man-centered. But Jesus is in this command is telling us and telling his disciples go baptize others. If I paraphrase he's saying go show everybody that by becoming part of me, by allowing your lives to be transformed in the sacrament of baptism, I transform you. And by so doing, I take you up into the life of the Trinity. Now remember, Jesus is both God and man. He has a human nature, but he's also the eternal son of the Trinity. Now we're moving a bit closer to the whole idea of the will. And we, this is a beautiful passage. Obedience, remember, Jesus came out of obedience. Obedience is indeed not only a human virtue practiced by man with reference to God, 
no matter how surprising this may sound to those who can only conceive of an autocratic God, obedience is also a divine virtue practiced among the persons of the Trinity. And it is hence the binding paradigm for the life of faith. That's really incredible. It's so powerful, I'm gonna read it again. Obedience is indeed not only a human virtue practiced by man with reference to God. So that we're familiar with, okay? We obey God. No matter how surprising this may sound to those who conceive of an autocratic God, obedience is also a divine virtue practiced among the persons of the Trinity. Now, again, language, of course, is always going to limp slightly when we're dealing with the mystery. But that great insight that the Father commands, the Son obeys, the Holy Spirit communicates. So the Son is obedient to the Father. Okay, so that's what he means by it being a divine virtue. The Son obeys the Father. And I've really pondered this, and I found that the more I pondered it, it gives a very good answer to many of the problems people have, because we know, and we saw that in today's liturgy in the office, we know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in majesty, equal in glory. They share the same substance. There is one God. Therefore, even though the Father commands and the Son obeys, that doesn't mean there's inequality. Whereas on earth, because of our fallen human nature, we tend to think that someone who commands is kind of superior, is better, is more powerful, has more rights. But that's not the case at all. And so when people get, <coughs> you know, for whatever reasons, um, for example, they don't like the whole idea in, in the marriage ceremony of, of the wife promising to obey, or they don't like the nature of the hierarchy of the church, or they don't like the nature of the commands or the beliefs of the church and seek to change them. A very strong answer is, look, if you start undermining this, you are in fact trying to undermine the nature of God himself because the eternal begotten son of the father obeyed the father in all things, perfectly in every way. And that's the bit of theology we've got to keep coming back to, that the unity of God comes through the fact there's this one will. It's one will in which they all participate and which is at, along with love, the very essence of what it means to be God. So Jesus explains, I haven't got the quote, but I'm sure we can find it. Jesus often explains to Louisa the relationship of love and the divine will is very very important because we know John says God is love and the trinity we could say is a communication always there from all before time a communication of love but love stems from the will that's why to love someone is actually not primarily an emotion it's an act of the will. I, rem I read a, a great book once called Love and War in Western Society by a French author who I think's name was uh, Rochefort. In there, he had this beautiful quote. He was, what he was doing is, uh, just as a little aside, he was comparing how when war changed and war became more modern, more brutal, there was less contact with the person you were fighting. Love changed. And his whole thesis shows these two things changing hand in hand. 
But one of the little comic asides he had is he quoted a Hollywood um, star who I can't remember his name, who said, um, I'm so glad that I'm getting married for the first time. <laughs> so you have there this idea, oh, I'm getting married for the first time, but you know, I'm sure there'll be others and I'm sure, you know, things will come. And so we fall in and out of love or we fall in love with love itself. But love is an act of the will. To love someone is to want and to desire the best for the other person. So when the father commands the son, and I'm thinking on the top of my head, so I hope I don't commit any heresy here. When the father commits, uh, commands the son, go to earth, son, go redeem the world. This is an act of love between the father and the son. This is not a father, no matter what it entailed, being harsh, telling off his son, kind of saying, well, you're going to have to do this, I'm afraid. You can't separate love and the willing God. And so that's why obedience must always be the focal point of our faith. Along, we could say, with the virtue of humility, which they go together. So I'm going to read it because I'm going to continue his quote. No matter how surprising this may sound, obedience is also a divine virtue practiced among the persons of the Trinity. And it is hence the binding paradigm for the life of faith. For obedience is one of the chief attributes of love, whether human or divine, because the lover longs to please the beloved as the fundamental condition for his own happiness and reason for being that wow i mean i just you read that it's just a masterpiece let me reread it for obedience is one of the chief attributes of love whether human or divine because the lover longs to please the beloved okay so the son his whole being in a sense his whole personhood is Love of the Father, that's what he came to earth to teach us. Love of the Father, so much so. Again, I go back to that beautiful definition, but I'm using it now in a different, slightly different place. So that we can say Jesus' human nature, when it was joined to his divine, was so transformed by the Holy Spirit that his love for his heavenly Father remember we're talking about his human nature now, energized everything. It's what made everything he did the reason for his own very happiness. So think about that. The very cross he suffered, the very torture, the great sacrifices, was indeed the very reason for his own happiness, which is why if, when you follow those last few days in Mary and the kingdom of the divine will, she constantly says that, look, we suffered this, we had constant hardships, constant pains, but in all of them, because we had God's will, his being, his love at the center of them, they became joy and full of conquests. This is so important. Otherwise, the cross, there's a danger in, in certain Western um, Christianity. There's a danger at looking at the cross purely as negative. Now, obviously, it is something we have to undergo. It is a purification. It is all those things. And it always will remain difficult. Suffering is difficult. But we have to complete the picture and realize that actually in it lies our very reason for being and our happiness, which is why in the book of Hebrews, it says about Jesus, he underwent, I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing, he underwent the cross for the sake of the glory and happiness in store for him. So this obedience and this connection of obedience and love 
and will is central to understanding why this gift is so important because it is going to restore that whole interconnection. So our very being, our love, our will, when taken up into Christ, through then obeying his will for us, is going to restore what had been lost. Because Adam and Eve, by disobedience, lost the fundamental condition for their happiness and their reason for being. Now, they recovered that to an extent during their long period on Earth. But only now, with the gift of living in the divine will, with Louisa, the first person born in original sin who had the gift, is held up for us that this interconnectingness of Jesus through his divine nature in the Trinity is now allowing us, like Christ or together with Christ, to not only carry out the obedience that we owe to the Father, but to be taken up into the divine life of God himself, so that that will, remember the will and love, the essence of God, becomes the principle of our action. So it is a little bit difficult. I'm gonna take a pause here. It's a little bit difficult. Before I take questions, I'll just quickly run over the, the points in a very simple manner. So we started from, all that Jesus has all, all authorities given to him. Why? Because his two natures in the one person means that he carried out everything the father did as an act of love. Therefore, all power and authority is his by right and by his actions. So he came to show us that he only does what the Father shows him to do. So everything Jesus did, the principle of the action was the Father. Therefore, we went on to say, we can see then that obedience is at the very root of the spiritual law. Thirdly, Jesus taking these two natures enables us through the gift now of living in the divine will, not only to obey, but as his human nature was to be taken up so that we can say, I only do what Jesus shows me to do. I cooperate and allow Jesus to be the principle of my action. Hence, we are restoring that which was lost. Why is it restored now? Because God's reasons are not our reasons. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. But he has chosen this time to allow this gift to be given that Adam and Eve lost. Okay, that was quite, hopefully not too heavy going, but some things of interest, but any questions? Because this is one thing, and remember, this is a revision class. We're going back to basics. So this basics is, the, is really fundamental to everything else we're going to learn about living in the divine world. I can see everyone reaching for their bottles of whiskey beneath their computer desks. Okay, Derek, is there anything you, anything you can add you'd like to elaborate on? 
It's not good picking on me, Father Dominic. <laughs> I'll pick on someone you're gonna to, else. You're gonna to, I think I think Daniela's coming on. She's she's got her screen live. That's right. uh, that's a clear indicator. You but everyone we we have as long as everyone is if, if everyone's happy about this, that's great. We can move on. But we always have to go back to this. It's easy to forget. But the more we go back to this simple thing and we look at Christ and his life, his obedience, his his living, his joining of his two human natures, the more it gives us the energy to continue to work, not only at living in the divine world, but being obedient to God, which, which is not easy. It's not easy. And we're going to fall. And there's going to be times when we drift out of it. But it's an incredible thought when we think, okay, I've got this temptation. I would love to give into it. Okay. I'd much rather pursue this route than this dryness. I'm seeking a way out of everything. If we suddenly realize when we make those choices, it's not only that we're not following God, we're actually undermining our own being. There's an element in which um, we become less of who we are. And likewise, when we are obedient and when we ask God's divine will to be the principle of our actions, we're then on the journey to becoming who we're truly meant to be. It's, it's just amazing. It, it's, you know, God, it's so such a beautiful plan of God, this. Um, to allow a blessed fault, as we say at the Easter Vigil, to become then that reason for something even greater. Isabel? Yes, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, because uh, our first fathers disobeyed and Jesus is the new Adam and he obeyed without a God that obeyed we would have not been able to obey the way he wants us to obey so by Jesus obeying the father he's giving you know showing us the way He's the only one that can show us the way to obey the Father, the way the Father wants to be obeyed. Only the Son could do it. And now we can mirror Jesus. It's not easy sometimes because we're so in disorder that it's not easy. But uh, we can mirror Jesus and he can show us how to obey now. Is that right? That's very well put. Just a slight additional gloss. Only the sun could show us the way, but we could only be taken into that because he had a human nature like ours too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Good. Excellent. Okay, I think I've given you enough time off to... Uh, Recuperate. Mother Dominic, can I throw in just two thoughts? Yeah. Um, just to embellish really what you said. Um, you spoke about um, the son is perfectly obedient to the father because the father, the father loves the son and shows him what he's doing. And I, was, I think I've covered this in the last couple of weeks, but I think it's a message that just needs to be emphasized again and again and again so that we can really understand the new era that we are in and that is that um god the father is showing us what he is doing for example through louisa's writings and through the teachings of saint john paul ii benedict pope francis and god is showing god the father is showing us what he is what he is doing so that we can join in that work, particularly in the sense of this gift of living in the divine will. Um, I've been reading some slightly less contemporary teaching on the interior life, books going back a couple of hundred years sometimes. But they seem to be speaking about us in this time. They're, they're so focused on the divine will and on 
there's there's some really good teaching on the heresies to be avoided um and i just kind of feel that um we have a unique season of grace upon us at this moment in time and part of that season of grace is being able to hear the father in his um, rather extraordinary revelation to us with regards to this gift that Luis offers, which actually calls us to the interior of Trinitarian life. Um, we're not lo no longer outside, if you like, ad extra. We're now ad intra. Um, and um, I think I'm kind of just sort of emphasizing this so that we can actually really live it out. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. So second half, I thought the best thing is to look at then as tied in by an extract from Louisa's diary, because after all, we have here Jesus teaching Louisa about the Trinity. This is August the 14th, 1932. I didn't jot the volume down. I think it's volume 31. Volume 31, August the 14th, 1932. But before I do, very briefly, so I, it is going to be brief, but just jot them down and have a think about them. Very briefly, there's three ways we can go deeper into the Trinity. One is knowledge, so we can learn about the Trinity through the great fathers, the great theologians, and through the study of important passages in scripture, for example, especially John's gospel, The Last Supper. So that's one way, that's an important, just like in the divine will. The more we learn as we're doing tonight, the deeper we can go. The second way though, is contemplation, that knowledge should lead to us contemplating God. In other words, gazing upon this mystery. After all, it's easily said, three in one, one in three, one God, three persons, and to sit, and to be open because God's knowledge that he wants to infuse into us is so much greater than our human knowledge, although we need that as a foundation and a platform. But the third thing that's come to me recently is perhaps the greatest way is actually adoration. To adore God is to bless God. The catechism. It came to me because I've been following this catechism in a year on and we're on the liturgy now. It's so beautiful. You know, each day that it's it's a gift, this gift that John Paul II masterminded and involved people in and gave to the church. Is, it's a great gift. You know, and it says in there that the whole of scripture is a story of the blessing of God being passed on. When God blesses us, he bestows power and might and light and being. When we bless God, we give to God adoration and thanksgiving in surrender. That's from the catechism. To bless God is to give adoration and thanksgiving in surrender. It's a beautiful phrase that. So like the Magi, when they see the Christ child, they prostrate themselves. That's the first thing is that adoration or the blind man falls down or St. John in the book of Revelation. So always remember as we're, we're doing a little bit on the Trinity, you've got that, you've got the knowledge, you've got the contemplation, and then that should lead to adoring God. So that was very short. It's just food for thought. So, volume 31, August the 14th, 1932, Jesus speaks to Louisa. My blessed daughter, my will produces the light in the soul. The light generates knowledge. 
light and knowledge love each other and generate love. So he's saying to Louisa, my will, that's the divine will, when it acts, produces light in the soul. So again, this is this infused knowledge we're talking about here. And that light that shines within us generates knowledge. And because the, the translation I think is not good here, so I'm gonna paraphrase it as what I think their meaning here is. The light generates knowledge. And because light and knowledge are so bound together, that generates love. So we have this light and that comes, everything is grace. God always is the first instigator. He shines light in the soul. That produces knowledge. The light and the knowledge are so closely bound that it generates love exactly as it's doing in the Trinity. So that where my supreme will reigns, the sacrosanct Trinity, this is gonna be difficult, we'll explain, reigns in act. Okay, let me repeat that. So where my supreme will reigns, the sacrosanct Trinity reigns in act. What, what does that mean? Um, Jesus is saying, where his supreme will, when a soul says to Jesus, look, come reign in me. I don't only, Lord, want to obey you. I want you to reign. I want you to energize all my acts. When that happens, he's saying, the Trinity itself is reigning in our souls. And there's this difficult word in act okay so this is this is a little tricky what does it mean that the sacro, the sacrosanct trinity reigns in act when we allow jesus to reign in our souls one of the dangers when we think about the trinity is there's a great natural almost pull to think of the trinity as static because we're limited in human language and we're absorbing things and we're trying to get to this, we forget or we need to consciously remind ourselves that the Trinity is always in action. It's power, it's might, it's love, it's constant, you know, our human words fail, motion, energy. As Master Eichhardt, the Dominican said, he, he said laughter. The father laughs at the son and the, laugh, the son laughs at the father. So it's this extreme, incredible vibrancy that goes, of which creation itself is only an image. So what must that like? So when the Trinity, through us allowing Christ to come and act in us, when it reigns in act, it means that power, that being, that motion, that energy is within us, is operating. Remember, our souls cannot be bounded. Our adorable divinity is carried in nature in an ir irresistible way, without ever interrupting to generate continually. And the first generating act we do is ourselves. So here's a little amazing, we've got Jesus talking about the Trinity. The Father generates me continually. Remember, generates to give life to. The Father generates me continually, and I, his son, feel myself generated in him continually. The celestial Father generates me and loves me. I am generated and I love him. And from the one and the other proceeds love. In this generative act, without ever ceasing, it encloses all our admirable knowledges, our secrets, our beatitudes, the times, our dispositions, our power and wisdom, all as much as the eternity. 
enclosed in one single generating act, which forms all the whole of our divine being. Wow. What is Jesus saying here is this generating act that the Father constantly, it's energy, the Father's constantly giving life to the Son, the Son is constantly re receiving from the Father. The generate what proceeds from them is love, which is the Holy Spirit. Within that is everything. It's power, the Trinity's power, it's light, it's dispositions, it's wisdom, it's beatitudes, it's secrets. So when we say, and we invite in a simple act for Jesus to come in and the Holy Trinity reigns in act, this is all going on within us. And producing within us such beauty and light and glory that the human son, sorry, the natural son, the created son, is only a little image. And yet we know how important the son is for us, you know, for, for everything now. Hence, this reciprocal love of ours, you know, between the Father and the Son forms the third person of our inseparable supreme being. Uh, so I need to switch a light on. Can't read anymore. It seems that he is not content with our gener generating act in ourselves. So let me just pick that up. So the Holy Spirit, that relationship between the father and the son gives is a person the holy spirit but he wants to generate outside of ourselves so the holy spirit then wants to move this inner life of god into souls that descends in souls and goes to form with his light our defined generation Indeed, he can do this in one who lives in our will. Outside of him, there is no post in order to form our divine life. Our word would not find the hearing in order to make itself listened to. And lacking our knowledges, the love would not find the substance in order to generate. And behold, our most holy trinity disarranged in the trinity. Therefore, only our will is that which can form this divine generation of ours. Hence, be attentive to listen to that which this light wants to say to you in order to give him the field to his generating act. So what he's saying there, it's very difficult. And I can't wait till we get a proper English translation with notes and footnotes and uh, comments. What he's saying now is, the Holy Spirit then that comes, proceeds from the Father and the Son is then given the task of bringing this life to us so that when a soul accepts it, it brings that light and life and majesty and power to the soul. And the Trinity finds itself with a home to go to, if that doesn't sound too simplistic a comment. Whereas if a soul doesn't, the whole trinity finds itself disarrayed. And I was just reading recently, I, I didn't jot down the... Jesus says, therefore, people who act, who live on earth, but who don't follow his will, are like robbers. They're benefiting from the sun, they're benefiting from the beauty, but they're robbing it from God, because it's only meant to be in conjunction with his life coming to us. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. It's a couple of minutes before um, nine, nine o'clock. That's a good place to stop. So I apologize, it's been a bit, hopefully not too heavy, but just hold on to these very simple principles and of the beauty of the life of the trinity 
which has its existence from its will and its love, communicated through the Son by taking human nature to us, drawing us up into living in his very will itself through the gift, and hence the importance for us in our lives and our pursuit of this, of the necessity of obedience and humility. That through those, we find the very reason for our being and our happiness. Well, Susan's smiling, so at least I've got, I've got one, one person there. So, um. oh, that, that was fabulous, uh, yeah. Dominic. And I particularly loved the laughter of the Trinity. That really, really appealed to me. Thank you. Yeah, I've got lots of notes, so I'll be uh, trying to work through them. Great, thank you. And remember, Derek and I, we realised that in this teaching, there's going to be bits you're going to take away, look through. And we're here, you know, you might have a question, you might go over your notes and say, oh, I can't quite remember that, or I can't. Either, you know, send us an email or have a question ready. Questions are so important for the group, often, mm -hmm. or like Isabel, when Isabel again puts things in her own words and reiterates that, it helps everyone. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. So still um, light. Uh, uh, hi, Father. I'm just to throw a thought in. Um, you spoke earlier about the Trinity being in act. Um, I think you were quoting Louisa. Uh, the one of the things that I was reading about the the single the one act of the Trinity. Um, from a a book called Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, just a bit of light bedtime reading, really, um, was um, how um, the Trinity have but one act. We have multiples. But because of this new gift in this new era, we can now participate in that one act that the Trinity have, so the single act of the Trinity. So our acts can be all contained and we can be carried up into that mm. one act. Now, Father Joseph talks about this in his thesis, where he talks about the mystical life of prayer, and he talks about the mystery of the mystical life and how this experience of being caught up into the eternal mode, caught up into the interior of the Trinitarian life, is something that is beyond experience. And therefore, we can talk about it, we can gain knowledge of it, but experiencing it is a different thing. And therefore, there is this, we have to trust in God's word to tell us what's going on even though we can neither see nor feel what's going on mm. and i just wanted to sort of kind of pop that one in just to say you know we participate in that act even though we may know it neither feel it nor see it mm. um and the other thing was um just kind of remind people that um you know you you said quite a few things about the father in this teaching which has been beautiful to hear and i can't remember who said it now but i've i read it in recent times that the millennium that we're living in now has been specially consecrated to the father and therefore we are in the father's era the era of um, an individual peace leading to a universal peace and it's so important for us to as it were in our adoration in our contemplation to begin to discern the father's activity. Um, I particularly like what Our Lady says at Medjugorje um, because she keeps on saying, this is a time of grace. She repeats it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we realize what a time of grace that we are in and how we should respond to the graces being offered. 
Um, so sorry, I've hijacked you ever so slightly at the no, very end. No, no problem. Mm. No yeah, the, the, uh, just kind of not, not a team, but a comment is, you know, some of these words like act, I'm not going to go through it tonight, but the philosophical depth of this, of what's included in some of these teachings, people are going to be mm. writing theses on like the passage I've just read. It, mm. It's another proof that it's from God. Nobody, nobody could come up with this mm. teaching of Jesus in a way that was came from a human imagination. It's absolutely impossible. The truth and the depth that ties in with revelation, the fathers, the philosophers, scripture, it's just mind-blowing. As Derek says, when we start to see things through this lens, all sorts of other things, we go, oh, yeah, I see now. I see mm -hmm. where that was going. I see where he was going. I see what, how God prepared that. Okay. We'll finish with prayer. <coughs> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, let's just have a couple of minutes of quiet, of silence, and invite the Holy Spirit, the great teacher, the advocate, the consoler, the paraclete. Let's ask him now to bring all this teaching that is God's teaching to perfect what was lacking in it into our hearts to give us this inspiration to be prepared to give up everything for this pearl of great price. Mm. And then secondly, in this period of quiet, ask the Holy Spirit to also, we'll all have little things that need to be purged. There's going to be bits of our human will, bits that fight back, until that final purification, let's ask him to come and to burn that away. So the first thing is to teach us Holy Spirit, to perfect in us what we've learned tonight. And secondly, to remove from us any obstacles hindering putting this into us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
May the Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end, and may his blessing come upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Derek. Thank Thanks, Father Dominic. Great good. fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Good night. Good God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Yeah. And thank you, Father, for the arrows of the passion. It was great to have that rotor again. Okay, good. Okay, bless you. Bye now. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Maria. Father, can I just ask you, do you know Father Kevin Avila? I don't. I look forward to getting to know him. I've only seen him on a Zoom chat. Oh, right, because he reckons he knows you. It must be another one. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, well, maybe we bumped into each other, but I'm going, I'm hopefully when he's settled in, I'd like to come up and visit with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Good, Maria. Okay, though. Thanks. God bless. Night. God bless. Thanks. Night.